guilty of spamming for writing uh, her professors uh, a very civil and very respectful uh, email uh, set, but saying they, they reduced the semester by two days, but they're still charging us as much. And they did not tell the students that they were doing this. And just protesting that. She was, uh, they brought up our in charge of spamming, and even though the Electronic Frontier Foundation and FIRE became involved in it, and they, they, they eventually found her not guilty, um, when asked, they said, oh no, no, but if she does anything like that again, we're gonna, uh, we're, we're gonna bring her up in charge again. Um, and so, so uh, Michigan State University still has a back now. Uh, meanwhile, an early FIRE case, um, I just talked about this on Stossel, um, at University of New Hampshire, um, Okay, and this is just a plain old ordinary political practice case. Um, but, uh, okay, working class student. His mother works at Walmart, his father is an electrician. Uh, University of New Hampshire, he lives on the seventh floor of the dormitory. He uh, was sick and tired of students taking the elevator not just up one floor, but also down one floor. They were basically thinking that 18 year olds can take the stairs down one floor. Um, and they were taking the elevator and it was slowing him down being on one of the top floors. So he made a parody out of, based on a step class that was currently being offered in the gym, saying that uh, the nine out of 10 freshman girls gained 10 pounds in their first year, but there's something you can do about that. Take the stairs, especially <laughs> if you live below the seventh floor. Now, is this a joke that I would, as I always say, this is not a joke I would have made to my sisters, but this is unquestionably protected speech. This is, like the idea that this is anywhere close to the line. This is, that there's no question whatsoever that this is, this is clearly protected speech. University of New Hampshire is bound by the First Amendment. Easy as, uh, easy as possible. And the student apologized as if he had committed a war crime after he, he was caught for this. I mean, seriously, like you would have thought this, was a, this guy had massacred like a, a village or something like that, given like how much he apologized for it. He was nonetheless found guilty of violating the affirmative action policy, disorderly conduct and harassment, two years probation, kicked out of the dormitories, had to live out of his car, um, mandatory psychological counseling, 3,000 word essay, a public apology. Um, I mean, mandatory psychological counseling, too, is one of the creepiest things that I ever ran into. And like, what exactly would you talk about for, for, for this kind of conviction? Um, so, I mean, if you can't make a joke about the freshman 15, if you can't complain about the fact that the, the semester is, is two days shorter and you didn't get a refund check for it, if you can't publicly read a book, we, we've done something very wrong. Meanwhile, uh, given that this is a, a, a more libertarian leading group, as best I can tell, um, I want to talk about private college. Now, uh, FIRE has a very you know, free market, freedom association approach to private colleges. Um, and that is simply that you have the right, if you want to start a really repressive college, you both have the right to join and to found um, a, a really repressive college. Um, you, you, you can organize around whatever beliefs you want, and you just have to get people to actually go to it. Um, the reason why you don't have to be too afraid of this principle is it's, it is, there, there is a market for it, don't get me wrong, but there's a small market for schools that actually say, listen, we're gonna limit your freedom of speech here, we're gonna limit your academic freedom here to Mormon or Jewish or uh, whatever, or socialist norms or whatever. Um, there's just not that many people wanting to go to those. So the overwhelming majority of private colleges know, just as a matter of, of market economics, that they're not going to get the best students, they're not going to get the best professors unless they promise academic freedom and free, uh, and free speech. They also make billions of dollars in donations um, and, and tuition uh, by presenting themselves as citadels of freedom of speech. So you bet when Yale, for example, promises that you can think the unthinkable, mention the unmentionable, and what is it, uh, what is it think the unthinkable should be unmentionable? Um, uh, question the unquestionable, um, that you better be held to those, those promises. I mean, literally, a, a, billion, a multi-billion dollar endowment at Yale. So we hold them to those promises. And most courts, uh, most jurisdictions in the, in the country do also hold universities to their promises of freedom of speech. Uh, North Carolina doesn't, which is a little frustrating. But uh, Massachusetts and New York, uh, New York in a very strong way. So, Yale had actually been doing a pretty good job at this, and I was going to use Yale as an example because I, I, I quoted their code. Again, think the unthinkable, mention the unmentionable. Um, you know, powerful, passionate, and accurate, like what, what higher education should actually be about. And at Yale, uh, there's, a, there's a famous, like, famous among Yale's and Harvard people, um, that, that there's a Yale Harvard football game that I only knew about from The Simpsons, to be honest. And, and they get really worked up about this, and they like to make fun of each other.
each other in, in, in very sort of like fancy smarmy ways. And this year they actually, uh, last year they actually went pretty highbrow. They quoted F. Scott Fitzgerald um, from one of his first books that said, in my opinion, all uh, Harvard men are, are sissies. And, and they put, uh, posted under that, we agree. The full quote is, in my opinion, all Harvard men are sissies like I used to be. But they cut that part off and said, uh, we agree. Um, they were, uh, because one student claimed that, the, that sissies was a defensive term, uh, they were actually banned from using it. Now, the university backed off of that punishment, but they refused to, to uh, back off of something that they did at basically the same time where for a book called The Cartoons That Shook the World, they actually intervened with the Yale University Press, which is independent under normal circumstances, and prevented them from printing pictures of the Muhammad cartoons in a book about the Muhammad cartoons. And the university has, stu has stood by that punishment to this day. Now, um, it's one of those things where the very idea that you have to explain that kind of like if you're going to actually have a meaningful discussion about the cartoons, you have to see them for yourself. But again, Yale stands by it. Um, meanwhile, Brandeis University, uh, another university hasn't backed down, and this is a name for Louis Brandeis, probably, the, you know, as far as I'm concerned, one of the greatest champions of freedom of speech in American history. Um, the university is covered with quotes about the value of freedom of speech from <laughs> Louis Brandeis. Yeah. And there was a professor who, in the course of his Latin American Studies class, Latin American Studies, explains the term wetback. He explains it. Because a lot of people don't actually know that the term literally derives from swimming across the Rio Grande. And then he criticized the term. So he used an epithet to explain where it comes from and criticize it in a class about Latin American studies. And he was found guilty of racial harassment without a hearing. And it's like, I don't, well, well, it's just completely, like, so you can't even say something anti racist as long as someone, if someone objects. And Brandeis is yet to, to back down. So, and, and these are both colleges that promise freedom of speech to high heaven, and, 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 they, and, and they raise money on it. They get, they get students based on it. So, and that brings me back to speech codes. Um, we define speech codes as any, any campus regulation that punishes, forbids, heavily regulates, or restricts a substantial amount of protected speech or what would be protected speech in the society at large. Um, I think some some uh, decent, pretty good examples of it are. Rhode Island College has a policy stating that the college will not tolerate actions or attitudes that threaten the welfare of any of its members. Now keep in mind, you get punished under this code. And the idea that it doesn't even occur to universities that there's anything wrong with policing attitudes, uh, it, we, we have a lot of work to do, that's the problem. Um, Claremont, uh, Claremont University um, it, it says they will not um, it bans expressions of hostility against another person. <laughs> um, likewise, the University of Northern, Northern Colorado bans inappropriate jokes or intentionally, recklessly, or negligently causing mental harm to any person. <laughs> I always, I always like what it, I think of Hampton College. Um, I think it was in New, uh, uh, New Hampshire. Yeah, yeah. yeah, they have a policy banning psychological uh, intimidation or harassment of the person or pet. It's one of those ones I'd really like to know how, how they enforce that. Mm -hmm. um, then, of course, you have the uh, uh, the email policies. Like you know, uh, SUNY uh, uh, SUNY Brockport um, has a policy that bans all use of internet and email that harass, annoy, or otherwise inconvenience uh, others, including offensive language or graphics, whether or not the receiver objects, since other may come into contact with it. Now this to me is one of these, one of these funny things, like, and one of the reasons why when we talk about the political divide in the U.S. it's so asinine. Because when you take, when you go to the real extremes, like, because the funny thing is these administrators, they think they're the most progressive people on the planet, but they end up acting like a bunch of Victorians. Like the idea that kind of like, so I sent my buddy this really crude joke, and he didn't object to it, but they seeing it could actually punish you for it is something that, that, but that's, that's completely consistent with it. But the idea that they're acting like a bunch of Victorians uh, would never occur. But one of the things that we, uh, we definitely run into is it, the, the, the policies that are most commonly speech codes are harassment codes. And this has been true since the since speech codes started in the 80s. And, there's a, and I think there's a very good reason for that. Because everybody knows, everybody is trained with the idea that um, yeah, I, I believe in free speech and all, but I don't believe people should be harassed. Now, I agree with that, but 
but there's actually a legal definition of harassment um, that is about actually you know, harassing somebody. But they took advantage of the fact that nobody actually wants to say that they oppose harassment codes to define it in ridiculously broad ways. So, so far, every speech code that's been shot down by a university, um, by a court, a university speech code that's been shot down, um, with the exception of one, I think, has had a harassment code as part of that challenge. Um, and they always get shot down. The courts don't fall for it, but amazingly, students do. Uh, probably my favorite um, uh, harassment code is just this one, just because it's so badly worded. And keep in mind, this is a rule that you can get in trouble for. The University of Iowa defines sexual harassment as something that, quote, occurs when somebody says or does something sexually related that you don't want them to say or do regardless of who it is, end quote. I mean, that is laughably vague. That will be laughed out of court if that is challenged. I mean, it, it reads like it was written by a fourth grader. Um, and there was one that we actually did defeat after it was our speech code of the month, uh, which was Western Michigan University's ban on sexism. They flat out banned sexism, which <laughs> this is how they define it. The perception and treatment of any person, not as an individual, but as a, but as a member of a category based on sex. They're banning you from perceiving someone as a man or a woman. <laughs> it's just absolutely ridiculous. Um, so, and the, so what fire has been, you know, we've been frustrated with this. Uh, the law is not ambiguous. The law is incredibly clear. Uh, college students have robust fr First Amendment rights. K-12 is another issue, but college students have robust First Amendment rights. Um, speech codes are, are defeated every time they're challenged, at least when they go up on the merits. Um, uh, we, I, I think since I've been president of FIRE, we've had something like, thir we have, well, I think we're 13 and 0 at this point when it comes to speech code challenges, and you don't really get that. You, you, you'll at least have one on ball um, judge will find against you. But I mean, th th this is what I'm making my point about how clear the law is on this issue. Um, there's something called qualified immunity uh, that basically, and it makes sense. That essentially, like, if you're a cop and you violate someone's uh, civil rights, but in a, in a way that is only later found by the Supreme Court to be un unconstitutional, it wasn't really obvious that you were violating someone's civil rights, that you can't be held personally <coughs> liable for violating that person's rights. Now, we may not like, uh, but that would be kind of like for a, or like a technicality type thing. Meanwhile, if you're a cop and you prevent, you know, a bunch of people uh, based on the color of their skin from voting, you cannot claim that you were acting under color of state law, and therefore you can pierce qualified immunity. Because it's like, basically you're just abusing your authority to do something that is flatly unconstitutional, and you should not be allowed to do that. Um, so we actually made this argument, and we consistently, we actually wrote something like 260 colleges around the country telling them um, that their speech codes violated the Constitution. And we got, we, we sent a certified mail to both the president and the, um, uh, and, and the general counsel of all these schools. We wrote a law review article about it, uh, basically putting them on notice that they're in violation of the Constitution, which is actually a, a, a higher standard, that actual notice is a higher standard than um, uh, con constructive notice, the ownership of the standard. Um, and we finally actually pierced uh, uh, qualified immunity uh, just in September. Um, this is the case where a university president kicked a student out of school at a university in southern Georgia for a collage protesting a parking garage. I don't know. But like it, it's it's it, it, and I already thought this was a horrible case, but then when, when during the process of discovery, it turns out that this university president basically went to everybody on his staff and said, "I really want to kick this kid out. I, I think he's trouble." And everybody went back to him and said, "No, he's not. You can't kick him out. You owe him due process." He they even went they even had him investigate him on the basis of his religion, his health. He, he they end up uh, end up talking to one of his counselors on, on, on campus. Yes. Was he an art student? He, was, he wasn't an art. He wasn't an art student. He wasn't. He wasn't. No. Okay. <laughs> well then, he's busy. He's motivated. That's his thing. Yeah. Um, it's not. It's not, it's not the best plot. Sorry. Um, the uh, but it, it, it really is stunning that he, he was able to talk to uh, counselors like a, a counselor on campus and everybody came back to him like this kid is not a threat to anybody. I mean, this guy was a decorated EMT for goodness sakes and a Shambhala Buddhist. They very much picked the wrong guy uh, in this case. But because there was no way the university president could claim that he was acting under, uh, under color of state law, they pierced qualified immunity. And it's currently on appeal in the, in the 11th Circuit. But uh, um, in this case, it sends, it sends a good warning to university presidents that it's not 
Um, and I, actually, my guess is on appeal it's going to get worse. Um, but the uh, 